Good morning. Today's presentation is in relation to native vegetation. It's a short presentation. It's based on chapter 12 of Bates. And the chapter is from pages 471 to 510 inclusive. The introduction at 12.1 makes comment that loss of native vegetation is arguably one of Australia's most significant examples of environmental mismanagement. The native vegetation framework sought in the native vegetation uh, framework documentation are a reversal of the long-term decline and extent and quality of the vegetation cover by conservation and restoration. Regulatory controls in relation to land clearance are fundamentally state rather than federal responsibilities and clearance of vegetation may also be prescribed by development at a planning or by planning schemes at a local government level. At 472, that is page 472, Bates makes reference to a commentator, Farrier, who in part makes the following observations. The retention of native vegetation is only part of the story. These areas must also be managed to keep down weeds and pests. It's one thing for governments to restrict land use without offering anything in exchange, but we must provide, says Farrier, inducements. At 12.2, Legislation has been quite slow to address these issues where they arise on private land because the remedies require direct interference with traditional land rights and that is something which was observed from the outset in relation to environmental law. Now 12.4, Bates makes reference to the important decision of Spencer against the Commonwealth which is a full court of Australia, a federal court of Australia decision. And in that case, the plaintiff had been prohibited from clearing his land, depriving him of the ability to reasonably use the land. And that included um, timber rights and carbon rights. And the Commonwealth is thereby attempting to effectively acquire those rights without paying just compensation. And the claim in that instance was rejected by the federal court. Now, Bates goes on to talk about regulatory controls. Queensland uh, commences at page 484. And in relation to that commentary, there is reference to the Vegetation Management Act of 1999, which is, is of course, Queensland legislation. And the Queensland government was threatening not to apply the legislation in that instance unless the Commonwealth met demands from private landowners for compensation. And under the Act, compensation can be claimed from the state where a person incurs loss or expense in complying with the requirements of the Act. Bates makes comment at 12.24 that compensation provisions are unusual in modern environmental legislation. At 12.27, the Act requires that a vegetation management plan must accompany a, or accompany a development application for vegetation clearing under the Sustainable Planning Act. And at 12.28, a person reasonably suspected of committing a vegetation clearing offence may be served with a compliance notice by way of prosecution. Now, if you look at the footnote uh, 113 in Bates, he makes comment that the defence of honest and reasonable mistake of fact which would otherwise be available under the code, that is the criminal code, section 24, is taken away by the Vegetation Management Act. You, generally speaking, if one is prosecuted and you can prove that you honestly and reasonably believed an existing state of facts was true, then that is a defence to the prosecution. It's unusual to see that taken away. It is in this instance, it is, it is also taken away in relation to matters of drink driving, where people used to argue that um, even though they were over the limit, they honestly and reasonably believed that they were under the limit. So that's an example of strict liability, as is the case in relation to the Vegetation Management Act provisions. Strict liability essentially means um, the fact speaks for itself and the reasons how it got there are in a sense irrelevant. Your, log your mode of thinking is not part of uh, the uh, uh, process of prosecution. I'll move on to planning provisions at 12.35. Protection of native vegetation is uh, undertaken through planning controls. And at 12.36, land clearing may be regulated by development, as we mentioned before. 12.37, 
which effectively requires the removal of trees and other native vegetation um, to be undertaken with development consent. And uh, there's an instance there um, where a court um, dealt with a fine, um, which was $80,000, on the basis that the illegal tree removal involved gross negligence. So there was no direct intention, but there was gross negligence, and that still rendered um, the perpetrator liable to a fine of $80,000, less a discount of 15%. 12.37 deals with trees, and once again, the comment is made in relation to strict liability. Uh, so a breach is liable to be uh, prosecuted on the basis that uh, the fact speaks for itself. Over the page, significant trees may be protected individually through heritage listing. Local councils may use their powers under legislation um, to make what are known as tree preservation orders. So you can see that um, Native vegetation, in this instance, can be dealt with at the federal, the state, and the local level. At 12.39, Bates commences his commentary in relation to offsets, which is basically um, any work or action that makes reparation for losses in relation to native vegetation. And there are avenues where the offsets can be negotiated. And at 12.4, Bates makes the point that offsets are contentious because the offset site must generally be maintained in perpetuity for offset management, which is inherently insecure, of course. There are suspicions, Bates mentions at 12.40, that offsets are really a device for, permit, for permitting development that should not be allowed. Um, now, the net gain approach is referred to at 12.41. It is something which is part of the legislative scheme in Victoria, and it requires planning permits uh, to be permitted by offsets. And permit holders can request searches of bush broker database for native vegetation credits, uh, which match their requirements, and then purchase those credits to satisfy the required offset. However, before seeking an offset, the framework requires a three-step process to be applied, avoid impact imp impacts, minimise impacts, and identify appropriate offsets. It's in that order. 12.44, um, commentators point out that the in inadequacies of attempting to manage vegetation on a site-specific basis, there's reference to a decision of VCAT, which is the counterpart of our QCAT, in Queensland, where in that case, Member Potts uh, said that um, when one considers shifting the focus towards conservation, the first two steps, that is of avoiding and minimising losses, are the most important, particularly avoidance. Queensland has developed an environmental offsets policy similar to Victoria, uh, where the impact from development must first be avoided, if not avoided, then minimised, and only then do we consider the question of offsets. Now, if we move forward in Bates through to 12.58, offsets may be applied as conditions to development consents, for example, in subdivisions. We talked about that before. And that is all, all subject, of course, to review. And in one instance over the page, Bates makes reference to a case where, upon review, the court proposed taking into account the precautionary principle to extend the offset from one-fifth of a hectare to six hectares. Um, the point that we're making is that offsets are a matter of last resort, and that is covered in the commentary from 12.59 onwards for a while. At the tail end of 12.61, Bates says that a project must be considered on its merits before the question of offsets can be relevant, and that mirrors the discussion earlier that um, Firstly, they must be avoided. If not, they must be minimised. And only then do we consider the offset regime. At 12.67, Bates says it's too early to tell whether the win-win objective of offsets is being met. Over the page, the required test of improve or maintain is likely to generate legal argument, and the courts may well take a conservative approach to the interpretation. Bates then goes on to make comment in relation to the EPBCA, where he says that the Act, the Commonwealth Act, of course, does not directly apply to native vegetation, and that is because of constitutional constraints that we've talked about before. 
but it does apply to threatened species and ecosystems and clearing of native vegetation may significantly act impact upon these matters of national environmental significance. Um, there's a case there quoted where a penalty of $220,000 was imposed for unlawfully clearing native vegetation that could significantly impact on endangered cockatoos. And that was done through the Federal Court of Australia, which of course the Federal Court is for the Commonwealth legislation. At 12.69, Bates makes comments in relation to Crown leases, where he says that it's ironic that the clearing of land, which had previously been encouraged by successive governments, is now being actively discouraged. At 12.72, all Crown leases are subject to a duty to care for the land, and conditions of occupation may include provisions relating to sustainability, care and protection of that land. That concludes my brief overview of Chapter 12 of Bates in relation to native vegetation. Thank you for listening.